Well, everybody understand, everybody's seen Contact. Um, and uh, Jodie Foster, when she was uh, being sent up uh, under, in the wormhole to meet the, uh, uh, the aliens, uh, got a nice picture of a galaxy uh, in there. And uh, she made a statement that uh, um, they should have sent up a poet. Well, our next, uh, our next speaker, when I asked him uh, to give me a short bio for, uh, to introduce him, sent me uh, a poem. So I think he's uh, after the Jodie Foster uh, poet slot in Sarah. So here's the uh, poem he sent me. While still a lad, he climbed high trees and watched the ways of bees. Soon he was scaling rocky peaks and hanging out with geeks. Retired in a peaceful place, he now explores deep space, seeking radio waves from stars, the music of the spheres. With that, um, welcome Dan Lane. Uh, go ahead, Dan. All right. Yeah, thanks. Good job reading that. Uh, just a quick sound check. Do I sound OK? Yes. All right. Um, And so you should be seeing uh, my screen now. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm going to be uh, just a very narrow focus, just talking about some algorithms for pulsar detection. Uh, I'm with the Deep Space Exploration Society in Colorado, and uh, yeah, we do have access to a 60 foot uh, 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 dish in southeastern Colorado, uh, which is great to use, but it's a long ways away. It's a long drive down there, and so we have to make the most of every opportunity. And and uh, and I also want to thank the whole team. There's been a lot of people working on this refurbishing this dish over the years to get it to work. And uh, I've just shown up lately and just having fun collecting data and processing it. So I'll be talking about that. Um, uh, slide two is just kind of the outline. Uh, the, I wanna talk about some of the observational properties of pulsars. Uh, the two algorithms I'll be comparing are one in the frequency domain, which is Presto, and the new one in the time domain is called Riptide. Uh, and it's, this is an empirical evaluation. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into the theory of the algorithms, just comparing data. Uh, so to start with, uh, just some observational properties of pulsars. You've seen some of these uh, basics before. Uh, pulsars are highly magnetized, rapidly rotating neutron stars uh, formed from the collapse of a supernova explosion. They emit a broad band beam of uh, electromagnetic radiation from the poles, the magnetic pole, and the pulse is observed when the beam points toward Earth. Um, you know, yesterday Wolfgang mentioned about the steep learning curve. Well, I'm, I think I'm at the bottom of that steep learning curve. There's gaps in my knowledge. There's a lot to learn. Uh, it's, it's just fascinating everything that we can do um, with this hobby. And um, I know, uh, you know, Wolfgang mentioned that, uh, you know, it's all, it's all about physics. And so I do go read some of the physics papers and scratch my head because, you know, they're talking about these spinning neutron stars and the papers make my head spin because uh, oftentimes they end up saying, well, we don't fully understand what's going on here. So this is still, pulsars are new enough. The, the models are not complete. The, the theories are still being developed. So it's, it's fun to be on the fringe of this. Uh, observables here include the, the period of the pulse, the period derivative, which is the rate of change, and the profile. Uh, pulse timing is very consistent. They make great clocks. Uh, the, the period of a, a pulse can range from um, some pulsars are down to just a few milliseconds. Others are as slow as uh, dozens of seconds. Uh, but the, the pulse intensity and shape can vary widely, and that can be due to the propagation through the interstellar medium. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about dispersion. Uh, scintillation is the multipath interference through the, the plasma, and then the, the Doppler shift, the, the motion of us. You know, the Earth is moving, so uh, those are some factors. Um, I'll start with this example, a beautiful example. This is from the Parks 64-meter uh, dish in Australia. Um, uh, I have visited Australia, but I'm not a citizen, but they make their science data freely available. And um, I, well, I think the scientist reserves 
rights for 18 months and then the data is uh, freely available. Uh, so I was poking around there and, and found some of their uh, one bit analog filter bank data uh, that the park 64 meter used. Uh, I think they discovered hundreds of new pulsars with it. In this case, this is Vela. Um, uh, just a beautiful example of very clean data with a very strong pulse. You can see the pulse. The pulse period is uh, down here. It's uh, about 0 0.9 seconds. And so you can see every about every nine tenths of a second, the, the pulse is repeating. Uh, it's very clean, very strong. This is the brightest pulsar. Uh, in this case, I downloaded the raw PSR fits uh, filter bank data from Parks. And then <clears throat> I use some Presto tools to generate a time series. And this is just with their tool explored app. Um, and one reason I'm using data from somewhere like Parks is uh, I'm trying to learn these algorithms and compare these algorithms. And uh, so there's the, the factor of the algorithm. There's the factor of the data. Do you have clean data, noisy data? <clears throat> and then there's the factor of myself, the operator. So I'm trying to eliminate uh, as many unknowns as I can. So I do have some samples of, of really good data so that I can understand the characteristics of the algorithm. So this is pristine data. Uh, this is the best you'd ever get. This is what we typically typically could get down there at Haswell with the Plishner 60 foot dish. And this is probably what you see also if you're looking for pulsars. Um, this, in this case, it's uh, B0835-41. Uh, this was a collection I did just uh, in June of this year. Um, so this is a much weaker pulsar. It has a period of uh, three fourths of a second, but it's really hard to look in here and see if there's any pulse repeating every three fourths of a second. So this is typically what we see. And uh, what we have to deal with is uh, trying to uh, integrate enough data to pull a pulse out of that. So uh, yesterday, Wolfgang mentioned dispersion. Uh, here's another uh, illustration of it. Uh, the higher frequencies are detected slightly earlier than the lower frequencies, uh, just due to the dispersion of, by the electrons through the interstellar medium. So this is the uncorrected delay. And then up here on the top is a uh, uh, pulse that's been de-dispersed and integrated. The dispersion measure that we use is proportional to the density of electrons along the line of sight. So there's a column of electrons between us and the pulsar, and that's uh, represented by the dispersion measure. When I first started this, I naively thought that the dispersion measure was also related to the distance. Well, it can be, but it certainly depends on the look direction. If you're looking down through the uh, Milky Way towards Sagittarius, towards the center of the galaxy, then uh, the dispersion measure is much higher than the, the real distance. If you're looking perpendicular to the uh, plane of the, the Milky Way, looking out towards uh, uh, Andromeda, for example, then uh, your distance will be much higher than the corresponding dispersion measure. Anyway, uh, this little equation uh, corrects the delay. It's just delta T is 8.3 times the dispersion measure um, times the bandwidth uh, divided by the frequency cubed. So in this case, the uh, units are uh, microseconds for the delta T. The dispersion measure has these odd units of, of parsec per cubic centimeter, and the bandwidth is measured in megahertz, and nu, the frequency, is in gigahertz. So there's, there's kind of two main factors I'll be talking about throughout. Uh, and one is dispersion and the other is folding. Um, you've probably seen this cartoon before where um, uh, there's a weak pulsar hidden in this noise somewhere. And basically we fold, uh, if it's a paper strip, we fold it at the desired period. It's either known or you're, if you're searching for an unknown uh, pulsar, then you uh, do a search trial. Until you find it, uh, you add them all up. So we are basically integrating or adding up all the small contributions until we get a pulse appearing. This folding can be performed in either the frequency domain or in the time domain. And um, so um, when we can, we like to use the professional algorithms. They're designed in, for pulsars to search for new unknown pulsars. 
but we can take the tools and uh, to detect known pulsars by constraining the search parameters. So instead of doing a blind search, we just say, no, we already know what the period is. We know what the dispersion measure is. We know what the factors are of this pulsar. We're simply trying to find it. We know which direction it is. We're trying to detect it. In the frequency domain, the basic algorithm is called uh, the incoherent harmonic summing. It uses the fast Fourier transform. Uh, the main tool is uh, Presto, which has discovered lots of new uh, pulsars, and it uses tempo in the background for timing. There's another tool, a newer, newer one called PS Archive, which uses tempo too. I'll not be talking about that. Uh, I do want to note uh, that Presto can also process time series data. So Presto is a large package of lots of tools. Um, so besides just doing the pulsar detection, it has other capabilities that can do time series, but it's not its strength. And it's uh, my experience is they're not as good. And so I won't be talking about the Presto time series capability here. When I say Presto, I'm talking about its um, frequency domain. In the time domain, there's a, a phase coherent search technique for the periodic signals. Uh, basically, you're looking for a periodic signal with the highest SNR, the signal to noise ratio. And the uh, fast folding algorithm has been around a long time. Uh, it was first described by Staline in 1969. Um, the version I'm using here is called Riptide. It's a recent Python C implementation. Uh, it's available on GitHub. And this is the main paper by Morello and others uh, from August of 2020. They uh, go, go into great detail of describing uh, their implementation of the FFA and, and uh, what um, advantages it offers. Um, the reason the fast forward, fast folding algorithm is getting more interest now is because, um, it, uh, in, at least in the case of Riptide, it makes uh, very efficient use of the CPU cache. So modern caches can enable algorithms to, to run faster. And so uh, for a long time, FFT methods dominated because they were faster simply because of the CPUs that were available. The CPUs that are available today are much faster and with better caches. So there's no longer a, a speed advantage to using the FFT. Um, I do want to make a note that the Riptide uh, FFA only does folding. It needs an external dispersion tool. And that's because uh, it was developed for a professional observatory where they have a data pipeline. And in that data pipeline, the uh, raw data is, uh, is already dispersed. So dispersed data is readily available in their pipeline. And so that is something to consider. We need the external DDoS version. Uh, the Riptide period search process does a depth first divide and conquer folding transform. So originally, the original al algorithm by Staline did a, a, a breadth first. Uh, they have found using the cache, it's easier to, or better to, better to do a depth first uh, transform. And it uses a matched filter. The matched filter is a boxcar, also called a top hat, uh, to find Gaussian peaks. Well, uh, pulse profiles can be modeled by a Gaussian peak. So a Gaussian can model uh, almost any of the pulse pulsar profiles we have. Uh, sometimes you need more than one Gaussian, you might need multiple Gaussians for a complex pulse, but uh, Gaussians work great. And a boxcar is a very quick way to find Gaussians. So basically we're doing a match filter for Gaussians. And uh, what the Riptide does is returns the highest signal, signal to noise ratio per period trial and per pulse width trial. So not only are they varying the, the time of the folding, they're also varying the width of the boxcar uh, 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 narrow to wide to, uh, to get the, the best peak there. And uh, when I say it's improved sensitivity, that's improved sensitivity over Presto, especially for narrow pulses in the presence of RFI or low frequency noise. That got my attention because uh, although in Haswell, a uh, very remote location, we don't have much RFI, we do have our share of red noise. We have some low frequency harmonic noise that does uh, make it harder to find the pulsars in, in when they're when they're weak weak ones. So um, 
I'm going to skip this flow chart for now. It's in the paper they describe it. Um, uh, so uh, back to parks. Um, I was just fascinated with this one because again, I wanted some nice data to understand the algorithm. I was looking around there and um, several years ago, they did a survey for pulsars in the large and small clouds of Magellan. So LMC is the large uh, Magellanic cloud. And of course we can't see the clouds of Magellan from uh, where we are here in Colorado. But if you've been in the Southern hemisphere, you can see, uh, see the clouds and the smudges there. And um, so uh, I just went through and, and found this one. Uh, it was a long, long clock, uh, many hours. Uh, in this case, I'm just using this as an example to show what riptide looks like. Um, and so time goes down on the phase. This is the phase time plot. Time goes down. And here you can see the pulse. I'm showing one and a half periods of the, uh, of the signal. And so uh, when it changes color here and you get a repetition, that's um, the next uh, period. So this is one period here in the gray. This is the, the pulsar pulse here. The gaps are due to scintillation and, and um, both plots. So this is the phase plot and this is the profile plot showing the detected peak. Uh, in this case, it has a very high SNR of 59. So it's a very strong signal, a nice clean uh, pulse. And again, this is with the, uh, the one bit analog filter bank uh, data that they converted to PSR fits and then I'm using here. Um, so this is basically what the uh, plot looks like. I've modified it a little bit, just to add in the, the header information down here. Um, I'm not doing a dispersion, uh, I'm not doing a distance search, so I'm not showing any dispersion measure plots. I just simply uh, print out what value I gave it because I fixed that, it's, I'm not doing a search. So that's the, the um, riptide plot. This next plot, shows this is the exact same plot I just showed. But what I'm gonna be doing here is comparing that with Presto. So this is the exact same plot we just looked at on the previous chart. Uh, in this case, the flux for um, this very distant pulsar is um, 0 0.3 millijansky, so it's, it's not very strong at all. This is the uh, Presto chart here on the left. Uh, last year, Wolfgang gave a great tutorial on how to interpret this. Peter East has also described how to uh, understand and interpret these plots. So I'm not going to spend much time on that other than just you know, this is the period derivative and the period, a two-dimensional view of that. You want these lined up. Uh, here's the dispersion measure. You want the dispersion measure to be non-zero. Uh, zero dispersion measure means you're looking at something right in your own shack there. Uh, this is the phase and frequency plot, and this is the phase time plot. Notice on Presto, time starts at the bottom and goes up. Over here on Riptide, time starts at the top and goes down. So that's a slight difference. Um, here you see a bunch of noise at the beginning for the first several thousand seconds, some noise. Well, you see the same noise over here on the Riptide plot. Uh, you see the same scintillation going on here that you see here. So um, I run this. <clears throat> the red box here is the uh, detected uh, topocentric period that Presto uh, came up with. And that's the exact same period that I ran it with. And in this case, it's the exact same period that Riptide found. So I give Riptide a bounding box for the period. I don't know the exact period. Um, I just give it a bounding box and tell it go find the highest SNR curves within that bounding box of the time. In this case, uh, down to the nanosecond, Riptide found the exact same period that, uh, that, that Presto has. So using uh, very good data gives me confidence that I'm starting to understand Presto and Riptide, and then I can go evaluate them when the signal to noise ratio goes way down and, and understand them better. <clears throat> um, so Amateurs operate at lower signal to noise ratio with uh, generally higher RFI than the professionals. Uh, we would love to have SNR greater than 10 for robust results, 
uh, as um, Wolfgang pointed out yesterday, often you know our target SNR is around five. If we get around five, we can usually get acceptable results. Uh, Peter East has modified Presto to use uh, SNR as a measure instead of uh, what what Presto uses is a chi squared uh, reduced chi squared statistic for uh, determining. Uh, the result, and, and Peter East has modified it for low SNR, and he's gotten good results with that. I do want to say here in this discussion, I'm going to be talking about two different measures of SNR, the time domain SNR and the frequency domain SNR. Uh, they both trend up and down the same, but they're not the same measure. So when I say expected, that's the theoretical uh, expected value for the time domain SNR, and I'll just denote it with a sub FFA. It's based on the profile. So it's the uh, total energy in the pulse, the square root of the number of samples uh, divided by the period times the square root of uh, delta is the uh, duty cycle of the pulse. And then uh, in the Fourier domain, the uh, theoretical or expected SNR uh, looks like this. It's, you know, H is the number of harmonics. Uh, S is the, uh, the signal strength. Uh, L is this generalized Laguerre polynomial, and um, the only reason I'm showing this is because I'm using these two equations on the next chart to show a comparison. So uh, I did not generate this. This is uh, lifted straight out of the paper by Cameron, where they uh, did a simulation to compare the expected SNR for FFA and FFT at different duty cycles. So here on the left, is the SNR for um, a duty cycle of 0.2%, and then this one is 1.0% uh, duty cycle. The dots, the discrete points, are the simulation results. The solid line then being the analytical. The analytical is the equation we had just on the previous page. So it has the equation, the analytical, and the simulation. They agree very well in both cases. In both cases show that uh, theoretically, F, the fast folding algorithm, the time domain algorithm, will uh, do better than the Fourier, uh, Fourier method, at least on this range of data. They were interested in data from 2 to 14 uh, seconds, so they're looking at long range pulsars, uh, longer period pulsars. And then this chart on the right simply shows the ratio of the SNR FFA over FFT. Um, as a function of the period, again, just showing uh, and for different, each color is a different duty cycle, just showing for different duty cycle that the FFA method uh, theoretically can be better. And so um, I also had some data from the Green Bank Observatory. Um, this is actually data I collected last year. So last year I submitted a request on the Sarah Skynet account for um, crab data, uh, did a six, minute collection on crab um, and got the Presto result on there. And then I said, I really want the raw data. Where is it? <laughs> uh, so uh, Skip Crilly was very helpful. Uh, he, since he uh, helps there, then he was able to set up an account where he can get through their firewall, get the raw PSR fits data. And uh, he put it in a Dropbox for me. And I think that's what Steve was mentioning earlier today, that the raw pulsar data for uh, Green Bank is available on the 20 meter. Uh, just uh, uh, get it through this process. Because then uh, once I have the data here, then I can and, uh, do you know play with it myself. Um, in this case, um, Presto uh, gets very good results. You know, the, the, the phase trace is getting fainter here, but you can still see it, very strong pulse. Um, the reason in the frequency plot that there's large gaps here is Green Bank uh, blocks out large gaps of their frequency due to RFI. So they have RFI, they just block out the whole, whole band. Um, so that result looks good. And that SNR was 7.3 in the frequency domain. Uh, I ran Riptide on the exact same data and uh, Riptide looks good. Uh, you see the, the pulse. Uh, good profile, uh, SNR 12.9, and the, uh, the period agrees at least out into the uh, uh, microsecond range. So um, I thought, well, what if I reduce the 
SNR, I can reduce the SNR. And actually, uh, the data, the PSR fits files are large. Uh, there was actually six of them. There's six files here for six minutes. Each file is roughly 60 seconds. When you run Presto on multiple files, it zero pads the slight gap in between. So there's a gap of a second or less between each of the collections uh, when they split the file. Uh, Presto zero pads that you don't even see that there's a gap here. But I thought I'll just I'll just run it on the first one and see what happens. So this is running um, the same algorithms on just one file instead of all six. So it's 68 seconds of data. SNR was 2.1. Presto fails. There's some hints that there might be a pulsar there, but you can't draw a conclusion. So in this case, I'd say it's inconclusive. Whereas when you go over to Riptide on the same data, the 68 seconds, uh, you can see the phase trace here and uh, you get a pulse. It's much weaker, 7.8, but uh, I think this is good enough that I'd say, well, yeah, I know there's a pulse there and that's what I'm trying to figure out. Do I even have a pulse? Presto would leave you with nothing. Whereas uh, in this case, uh, Riptide would say, yeah, you have a pulse. It's weak, but it's there. And that's kind of uh, why I'm using this new tool, Riptide, is this often happens with data I collect from Haswell. I say, oh, do I even have a pulsar? I can use Riptide to independently confirm that I have a pulsar and to help screen when I, when I don't. Um, Crab Nebula itself is, is beautiful. Very nice, pretty picture here. It's from the supernova remnant that was first observed in 1054. The crab pulsar is actually this red star right here in the center. It's one of, the, there's only a handful of uh, pulsars that they have identified an optical counterpart with it. So it's kind of unique. It's close enough. They can actually find the neutron star, see the, the optical counterpart there. Uh, the period is 33 milliseconds. Um, of course, there's polarization in the data, both in the radio and the optical. Uh, this image is from the, the optical, is from the Hubble Space Telescope in red. And the blue data is from uh, X-ray bands from the Chanda space tele or space um, satellite. So I'll finally get to uh, what we were doing there with our data in Haswell. This is the 60-foot dish. Um, everything is on GPS. We have a network uh, time uh, machine there for synchronization. Uh, we use Linux, so it's a System76 Ubuntu 20.04 host. And everything I'll be talking about in here was uh, either collected with a B210 or some of them with the N210 SDR. Um, there was three different feed horn configurations. One was at 408 megahertz uh, with this uh, LNA and um, the, the filter was at 90 megahertz. Uh, we currently have up to 1296 megahertz feed horn, which uh, is the same feed horn we use for the moon bounce. Uh, we do the, the EME moon bounce contest in the fall, and so it's actually right now that same feed horn. We can detect pulsars with that at those frequencies, and we also have used the 1420. The 1420 we use for hydrogen as well as pulsars and other experiments. Uh, on the software side, everything here runs in Linux. Uh, Murmur has been mentioned. It's a great tool. Um, it runs under Linux. I use the Wine emulator to run Murmur under Linux. I also use Stellarium to plan the observations. I use the uh, ATNF database from Australia to um, generate a .par file, which is, has the ephemeris uh, for the pulse. Or it tells the software exactly uh, what time um, to be looking for the pulse, and it has the dispersion meter, measure and all the published values. We have our own dish control software for the pointing and tracking. It was done by a group in-house. It's excellent, works very good. And so uh, we set up, um, you know, we set up a target pulsar, we point to it, start tracking, and then I turn on all the, the pulsar software. Uh, we have a software spectrum analyzer for looking for RFI, um, a GNU radio filter bank, uh, it originated with uh, Marcus Leach, uh, and then I, we got ours from Joe Martin, K5SO, that he had uh, simplified it quite a bit. I got it, and I simplified it a little bit more, and I converted it to uh, Python 3, so it would run with uh, Ubuntu 20, and I also just put a wrapper around it, so uh, it's all scripted right now. Uh, we're using the current version of Presto with Tempo. 
for pulsar detection and also using the current version of Riptide. Uh, that's available on, on GitHub. And there's some miscellaneous utilities, uh, SIGPROC and WattUtil and some others. This is the methodology. Um, I collect the data. Um, I've tried RFI masking, but we don't have that much RFI. So RFI masking doesn't uh, make much difference on, on the data I have. Over on the right, uh, when I run Presto, I run the prep fold command and give it the period and derivative. But then actually I'm using the dot par option. So this is all automated and it generates the Presto plot. Uh, in the middle, as I said, to run Riptide, it needs a D dispersed time series. So I use the Presto tool called prep data. Since I have a single uh, sub band here, I use prep data, no berry because we're doing everything in topocentric coordinates. And I give it the dispersion measure. And then I run that resulting time series into Riptide and I get the plots we've been looking at. Uh, Riptide will work with either pre uh, Presto or SIGPROC D dispersion. So I did also try SIGPROC D dispersion. It's older, it's slower, and I found that it didn't work as good. Um, SNR would be a little bit higher and sometimes these would be darker. So I really won't spend any time on the SIGPROC version. So I do want to show some comparisons now. This is back to the earlier one where, where uh, early on I showed an example of uh, 803, I'm sorry, 835-41, just uh, some noisy data. And this is what the pulse looks like once we process it through the software. It's actually a nice pulsar, a uh, good strong uh, SNR, 12.7. Uh, you can see all aspects of the Presto plot look good. And, uh, you know, Riptide shows a very uh, good strong pulse also in the phase and in the profile. And they have a close agreement on the uh, period. So, you know, starting to run these, I started building up confidence uh, that Riptide works and I'm starting to understand it, as well as uh, Presto. Presto is, uh, there's a lot going on. It takes time to, to learn Presto. Um, here's another pulsar. So all the pulsars from here on out are ones we've collected in Haswell. Um, this is uh, J0437-4715. It turns out it's the closest and brightest millisecond pulsar. So uh, its period is 5.75 milliseconds. It's a very fast one. Uh, it, it's the fastest one that we've collected. Um, and uh, so Presto uh, did good on it. Uh, it you, know, you can see the various aspects here that Presto is fine. And also, um, uh, the Riptide plot looks good, and, and mainly I check to make sure that the periods are both correct. So um, here's another one, B20, 20 plus 28. Happens to be a double peak pulse. It's called mode changing because there's a double peak, and it switches back and forth. And so that's something that the physicists are, are working on models to understand how the um, the peaks in this, you know, these very intense magnetic fields on these pulsars can, can generate these, but this is the data we see. Um, here, uh, the SNR was 4.8, uh, so it's getting down below, below five, and yet Presto still shows uh, acceptable results. You can see the phase trace, you can see the pulse profile, the P and P dot, um, and just as well, uh, Riptide also finds it. Uh, and both with a uh, very close agreement on the, the period. It's interesting, and I don't know why, but as you look at the data, you know, for about the first 9,000 seconds, it's hard to see any phase here. At the end, you start seeing the phase trace. Well, the same thing here. We have to go down, you know, for the first eight, 9,000 seconds, not much. And then towards the end, you start seeing the, the pulse. So that's just um, how it is with scintillation and how the data is sometimes on pulsars. Um, on that last one, we had the double peak on the right, but not on the left. Fascinating. Yeah. Don't know why. So uh, in terms of performance, um, again, Riptide does folding only. So if we're comparing Riptide with the basic Presto, we have to subtract out the de-dispersion time uh, because uh, Presto will do that on the fly for you. So... Uh, again, it, it's it actually, it's hard to compare time. It's like comparing apples and oranges. When you run Presto, you get one candidate plot. 
Uh, sometimes that's not as good as you want. And so you can iterate to improve the results. You can refine the value of the period. You can change values. You can iterate to improve the results. When you run Riptide, you as the user specify how many candidates you run. I usually say 10. Uh, you can do 100. You can do ever how many you want. Uh, so you get uh, a bunch of candidate plots back and they're ordered by SNR. Uh, so you need to visually scan the plots and it just it doesn't take any longer to scan these plots than it takes to look at the Presto plot. When you look at the Presto plot, you need to look at each part of it and see, well, does it all add up? Here you're just uh, flipping through a bunch of JPEGs real quick, looking for a, uh, a good plot at the right period. My experience here was uh, for any of our data collections less than an hour, either algorithm ran quickly in under just one or two seconds. So it really wasn't a factor. Uh, we don't have a huge data pipeline. You know, we do the onesie twosie thing. So that didn't matter. I did uh, have two longer collections. The 2020 20 plus 28, the one we just showed on the previous slide was three hours of data at, at uh, one millisecond sample rate. At the filter bank, the raw filter bank was 20 gigabytes. The time series, the D dispersed time series was 40 megabytes. The time for Presto to do D dispersion was 31 seconds. And then the folding was six seconds. So just looking at Presto, you see, oh, most of the time is spent in D dispersion. Folding doesn't take that long. And then when I did the Riptide folding on the same D dispersed file here, it took 12 seconds. So it took longer. Uh, uh, this is a very recent collection we did, B0355 plus 54. It was four hours of data, uh, much smaller sample rate. The sample rate we vary depending on the pulsar pulse rate and on the width of the pulse. So we try to set the sample rate to be about one tenth of the width of the pulse. So the sample rate will vary. Of course, that generates more data. In this case, it was 54 gigabytes. The time series reduced down to 212 megabytes. Presto took um, a little over three minutes to do the D dispersion. And then Presto took 17 seconds to fold and then Riptide folded in half the time, nine seconds. So uh, I only have two, two data points. <laughs> they don't even agree. Uh, one says Riptide is slower, one said Riptide is faster. So don't have enough data points to uh, you know draw any conclusion other than they're both fast enough for the work that we're doing. Um, I do want to show a few more um, examples here. Uh, B0329 plus 54 is the brightest pulsar in the Northern Hemisphere. And so that's one we often start with. And down at Haswell, we usually collect it before and after uh, when we do a long pulsar, just to make sure that all of our system is still working. I'm going to show a sequence here. This was um, um, this was using our 1296 feed horn, uh, 10 megahertz bandwidth, uh, and uh, in this case, a 10 minute collection. So Presto SNR 10.8, Riptide uh, the SNR was 36.6. Again, you can't directly compare the SNRs; they both trend up and down. Uh, both algorithms did fine, and um, uh, by the way. This plus 54 is also a mode changing uh, pulsar. So you'll see the uh, profile uh, change. So what I did was uh, similar to what I did with the green bank data. Uh, I trimmed it down. I cut it in half. No, this is, uh, this is a fourth. So uh, 150 seconds of the same data. SNR down to 2.7. In this case, Presto fails. Presto is not acceptable. You can't draw a conclusion here. Um, Whereas Riptide, uh, you still get a pulse in the profile and you can see a faint trace here. It's not a, a strong one, but there's enough there you can see with the eye and say, well, yeah, I think I, I do have enough data that I could declare uh, a pulse there. So another case where uh, Riptide works, Presto is inconclusive, although you know the SNR is below three. And then the last one in this sequence is I trimmed it down to 66 seconds. Both of them uh, fail. So uh, uh, Riptide did produce plots, but uh, I, I, I wouldn't, I can't see it in the, in the phase. Um, Riptide, when it gets down uh, this low, it's struggling. Uh, it's still trying to produce something, but if Riptide doesn't 
uh, find a curve, it won't produce any plots at all. So when you're running Riptide, if you get nothing back at all, you, if you told it 10 candidates and you get none, that means it didn't find any curves uh, for the uh, matched, you know, the top car or box car matched filters. Uh, I'll just show one more of uh, 0329 plus 54. This was another 10 minute collection on the same day as the previous ones. Um, uh, it was just a, a different collection. Um, why it worked on uh, 600 seconds before and now it doesn't, that's scintillation. Um, it, you know, there's really, you can't draw a conclusion here. It has a SNR again below three. Whereas with Riptide, you can look and see, well, I can see a, a faint uh, trace in the phase here and also uh, the strong enough pulse that um, I could declare it. Uh, it does have the correct uh, period. I forgot to mention on, on uh, like this one up here, uh, another reason, uh, and this is one uh, that I trimmed down, another reason I'd say, even though you can kind of see a pulse, a reason I say that it failed, it's got the wrong uh, period. The period is off by a considerable amount here. Uh, the same thing with uh, uh, Presto, both of them, you know, it can't get the right period. So uh, that's something to always check. I'll do a few more. Um, this was 1641-45. Um, a 30 minute collection, good strong results here with Presto. This is the dispersion measure here. Uh, noise like at 4,500 seconds shows up here. Same noise here in the pulse uh, profile. These gaps here on the frequency plot are due to my own learning curve. I had the gain set too high. Uh, so this was an early collect I did and I had the gain set too high. So the algorithm just drops that data is, is washed out. So I have learned to reduce the gain. Um, but in either case, uh, both algorithms did well on this one. Uh, here's another one, 1749-28. Both of them do uh, very well. Um, there was some data missing at the beginning. Same thing here, the data is missing at the beginning. And um, I think this is the last one I'll show. Uh, I've been showing kind of the pipeline view on Riptide. Uh, when you go to GitHub and download the uh, Riptide package, you also get a uh, Python notebook uh, package. Uh, I use the Jupyter notebook. You can use your own preference, but uh, the notebook is very handy. I used it to learn how to interact with the algorithm. So first I used the notebook to learn how to run it. And then once I got a handle on it, then I just script the uh, run, run the scripted version, the command line. Uh, but with the notebook view, you can go in and interact more. Uh, you get a little bit different uh, view on the plots and you can get a, a nice pulse profile as well. Um, so again, this was on uh, 20, 21 plus 51. Both of them did fine on that. Now, um, for, uh, for those of you using Windows 10 and 11 that might be interested in this, the um, Riptide is very simple to install. You just, if you have Python 3 installed, you just do pip install Riptide-FFA. It installs Riptide. The problem I pointed out is um, unless you're doing a nearby pulsar that does not need D-dispersion, if you're doing one further away, then um, Riptide needs a D-dispersed file in either the Presto or SIGPROC format. Well, uh, with Windows 10 or 11, uh, you can install WSL. That's the Windows subsystem for Linux. That's what Microsoft calls their virtual Linux. So when you install WSL, you're just installing a virtual Linux under Windows, which is fine because I do the same thing here. I run Linux, but I have a virtual Windows. So it all works out. But when you install WSL, um, you can configure it with uh, Ubuntu 18 or 20 or 22, your favorite Ubuntu. Once you have Ubuntu on there, then it's much easier to install and configure Presto or SIGPROC because either one of these packages needs a boatload of uh, libraries, all the old Fortran libraries, FFTW, all those things. And uh, uh, they need the GNU auto tools. But uh, if you use a package manager here, in Linux, it'll do most of that work for you. Or if you wanna stick with Windows, um, uh, Peter East and there's others on GitHub, you can uh, modify an existing code that does the D dispersion. The modification would be 
to simply put it in the format that Riptide is expecting. And the format is simply the, the data points. So it's a, a simple little binary file. Uh, in the summary of the uh, results we looked at, um, so here's the source uh, pulsar. I was interested in the dispersion measure and comparing it with distance. And you know, in some cases we had, uh, well, here was a, a very large dispersion measure, but the distance wasn't that great. Well, that's because you're looking down, uh, you know, the, the plane of the Milky Way. Um, here we have a very large distance, 49 kiloparsecs. Well, that's when we're looking outside the Milky Way into the large cloud of Magellan. The uh, dispersion measure was not the highest. It's high at 100, but uh, not the highest we have. Uh, here's the um, the width, the the half um, peak full of the uh, the, the W50 um, in milliseconds of the width of the pulse, the duty cycle uh, in percent. The uh, and this data is from the ATNF. Uh, it's the uh, flux at 1400. So even though a lot of these are at 1291, I use the 1400 flux just to help plan the uh, how long to do a collection for. So here's the, the, the topographic, I'm sorry, topocentric period produced by Presto. Here's the topocentric period produced by Riptide. These were the same values I was putting on the displays earlier. This is the difference, the absolute value of the difference. Uh, and it's very small uh, from a few nanoseconds to a few microseconds. And uh, you know that's within the capability of our equipment. I don't know that we can do better than that than some of these. Uh, these were the SNRs that I'd put on the previous charts, and I just used UTC for file ID. So a couple of these I denoted. Um, these were when Riptide uh, still worked, but Presto had failed. And, and I kind of noticed it was around three when, when um, the FFT SNR was below three, then um, uh, Presto really wasn't acceptable, whereas you could still see uh, something in, in Riptide. I did have some other ones I tried, uh, these two pulsars on data that we collected. Both algorithms failed on that. Uh, SNR was, was quite low, so there was nothing in those. Uh, both algorithms are free. They're professionally developed and maintained. Presto is uh, very well established. It's been around, I think, about 20 years. It's discovered many new pulsars. It was designed to um, discover uh, binary millisecond pulsars. So it was designed to work on very fast pulsars. It works very good on that. That's what it was designed for. So we're really not using it for what it was designed for, um, yet it still does the job for us. And it was designed for higher SNR at the uh, uh, big observatories. A con, well, Presto and Tempo are a boatload. When you start downloading those, uh, you know, keep notes. I, it took some time to do all that, but once you get it, there's a tutorial you can go through and, and start getting the hang of Presto. Um, Riptide is much uh, simpler. It's just, it's Python interface and uh, under the hood, it's all C. Um, it's better on long period pulsars. And so uh, the asterisk, this is a very recent result here. This was just published last month. Um, so uh, the long list of authors included uh, Morello, who was the uh, author of Riptide. They did a study at GMRT, which is the giant meter wave radio telescope in India. Uh, I think it's like um, 30 dishes. Each dish is 45 meters. And in this case, uh, Presto had already done a survey <clears throat> of the data. Presto had discovered uh, 43 new pulsars in that survey. And so what they did with Riptide, and it's a very detailed result with Riptide, they went and <clears throat> reprocessed the same data. Riptide found the same 43 pulsars and two, two new ones. It found two uh, slower pulsars. And that's what they've been finding is they've done the same thing with Arecibo data. They've gone back and reprocessed Arecibo data and Riptide will find some of the slower pulsars that um, Presto had missed. Well, a pulsar is a pulsar, whether it's fast or slow, it's, it's part of the, the, the life cycle of the pulsar. So they're actually using Riptide to 
fill in more data on the uh, life cycle of pulsars. They're finding more of the slower ones and, and doing more studies on those. And as I said, the runtime is equivalent. You get about the same runtime as, as Presto. The con, well, it's a new implementation, so uh, it may have some bugs in it. Uh, I didn't find any. Uh, the match in, in the literature says the match filter works best on single peak pulsars. Roughly 80% of the pulsars uh, are single peaked, and so the other 20% have a more complex uh, peak where you have multiple Gaussians. But what I found was the uh, match filter worked fine on the two examples of uh, uh, double peaks that, that I had here, so that seemed to work. And then the other con is it needs the external de-dispersion tool for the pipeline, the data pipeline that we have. Um, just some uh, use cases. Um, you know, I think it's great for, uh, at least, you know, for me, I'm still relatively new using Presto and uh, relatively new processing uh, this very weak, very low SNR data. I like having extra confirmation. So Riptide gives independent confirmation of these low SNR pulsars. Um, and sometimes when you run Presto, uh, the results are ambiguous. And at least to me, it's not obvious if the pulse is absent or if the folding parameters are wrong or something else is wrong. And so uh, you can spend a lot of time uh, iterating Presto, or I can just go run Riptide to screen the data because Riptide will come back and say if there's a pulse in, in, uh, in there at all. Um, or it could be an alternative to Presto. If, if Presto is something uh, you don't want to deal with, then I think Riptide makes a good alternative to it. And uh, that's my uh, last chart. And, and in, the, in the proceedings, there is this bibliography, the papers that I've referenced, uh, the other uh, presentations, and then the websites where you can uh, get the data and the codes. So uh, any other questions? I have a couple of questions, if I may. Yeah. Um, when you were uh, doing the Presto uh, processing and the Riptide processing, my understanding is that in both cases, you let the algorithm look for a period. Is that correct? So when I run Presto, um, I can either run it manually from the command line, in which case I tell it the period to use, or uh, what I do, uh, it's all scripted now, is I, I uh, generate a .par file from uh, ATNF, and it automatically, um, it, it has the barycentric uh, period in that dark par, par file, and it converts it to the topocentric period for my location. And that's the same way that Green Bank generates its Presto files. It uses a .par file. When I, run yeah, I, I, I was I was just wondering the uh, you can run Presto either with uh, letting it search for a period or just uh, define the period from the par file. But so you have to use the parameter no search if you don't want to search. And I, I got the impression uh, that you you in any case you let the uh, Presto search. Is that correct? Uh, I usually turn, I, I turn, I tell it no DM search and no period search and those things. So I turn off the searches. Um, uh, sometimes if I'm not getting good results, I will uh, open that up and let it search around. Um, with when I'm running Riptide, it's different. Uh, I give it a narrow, I give it a narrow bounding box around the known period. Uh, you know, the known period in this case is, uh, I, I, I start with the barycentric period. But I give it a wide enough band around it that it'll find the total period. Yeah, I, th I think that's one of the limitations also of uh, Presto that you can't give it a a uh, narrow range of uh, periods to search. Okay, um, another just more a comment on the B twenty twenty plus twenty eight. This um, you have showed the example where only during part of the observation something was visible. Um, the B2020 plus 28 is an absolute extreme example of scintillation. Uh, we have cases when we just don't see it, and we have cases when it's stronger than B03 2029. So it's uh, sometimes it's just blowing your, your dish out of the water uh, as strong as it is, and sometimes it's just gone. So it's, it's no surprise what you're, what you're getting, that uh, it comes up during uh, the uh, 
observation. So uh, you may try it a couple of more times. You will be surprised that sometimes it's very, very strong. Okay, that's good to know because, uh, like I said, it's, uh, you know, if you've been down to Haswell, you realize, oh, it's a long drive down there. And so we get there, you know, we get everything working and then we do our data collects. And sometimes it's, you know, it's, we get back home when we're processing the data. But um, yeah, when I collected that one, I thought, well, what in the world? There's nothing there. And then finally at the end, I didn't realize it had that such severe scintillation. That's good to know. I'll keep that in mind because it makes you wonder if something's wrong with your equipment or something's going on in the sky. <laughs> Yeah, we, we had to exactly that, that uh, we had a strong signal and a few days later it was just gone and we were just uh, saying, okay, there must be thrown something wrong with our equipment. Mm -hmm. um, just a uh, final question. Have you done any uh, comparison or have you ever tried to use PSR, uh, PSR Church, uh, PSR Chive? So uh, I did. Uh, I installed those tools and as I was installing them and I was running some of their uh, utilities, I realized uh, I really wanted to use a different, a second machine because uh, all the environment variables and all the software packages I wanted to use, I actually kind of want to use a different machine to set up PS Archive with Temple 2 and keep another machine for Temple 1. But So I really have not used those tools enough. Yeah, okay. Uh, PS Archive, in my experience, is a pain to install. <laughs> You might consider using virtual environments and that way you can create uh, different uh, situations for each on the same computer. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, there is a slight performance hit when you do the virtual. All right. Uh, I, I, think, it, I, I got some questions when you can. Can you comment on the impact of the data gathering time length? Because it appears that gathering more data dramatically improves the signal to noise ratio. Oh yes, absolutely, and that's that's the trade-off. Is uh, how long how long do we collect data for? Uh, we can't. It's hard to go down there and let data you know run data for ten hours. If you do a ten hour collect on these weak pulsars, you will have more data to fold, and you'll get a stronger SNR. But uh, for us, it's a trade-off. Is how long do you want to spend on one pulsar before you go to the next one? Can you copy me, Jim Bryan? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Can you hear me? It's Jim Bryan. Hello. Go, James. We can hear you. Okay. Um, I've uh, watched this with great interest. This is a wonderful presentation. You've done some wonderful work. Um, I wrote something similar to Riptide and published papers about it in the journal from about 2001 to 2010. You might want to look at that. Now, this one did not have all the features of uh, some of the other ones, but it was a completely homegrown system. It appears we detected a number of pulsars, but um, the project was not well received or well supported by uh, Sarah's membership at the time, and so I stopped publishing papers on it. But you might want to look at the data at uh, what was published and do a comparison. I, I would love to, to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, I will go look at that. Okay, any more questions? Uh... I uh, I got a question. Go ahead. Are you Peter? Peter, you are mute. I'm on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, good. Uh, super presentation, Dan. Um, I, I've got just one question. <laughs> um, when you ran Presto, you use the uh, incoherent harmonic summing to calculate the F, the SNR. Um, did you look at the the best profile and calculate the SNR that Presto produced um, for that? Um, so yes, actually I'm, I'm lazy and I didn't want to code up my own. So I'm using um, I0 NNA best profile to do the SNR. Right. But you use that from the incoherent harmonic summing, the FFT. Yes. Is the FFT SNR rather than 
the prep fold standard folding SNR. Yes. Yeah. With the prep fold standard folding SNR uh, should be the same as the FFA SNR. So I don't think they'll be the same uh, because they're uh, measured completely differently. They'll trend up and down the same, but they won't. You can't compare them numerically. Right. I, I know the the FFT SNR is always a lot worse because mm -hmm. the, the incoherent harmonic summing. You don't get the the full energy in the the folding algorithm in the frequency folding algorithm, but the the standard prep fold. Um, best profile is the the standard folding algorithm, and the FFA should also be equivalent to the standard folding algorithm. So they should both be pretty similar. So I'm going to go back and look at that because those those uh, that best profile just that ASCII text file. I'll go back and look at that. That's interesting. But it's a great presentation, and it's a super bit of work. A very excellent investigating job you've done there. All right, thanks. Hey, Dan, I have a question. This is Mario. Do uh, you hear me? Yes. Yes, first of all, I'm very happy that you are using both Murmur and Best Profile at Eliza. I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, the question is, can you comment a little bit more on Riptide installation? Um. On the installation of Riptide? Yes, yes. Uh, if you have, if you're running Python 3, um, then all you do on the command line is, um, I mean, there's various ways of installing pre uh, Python packages. You can use PyBombs or whatever you like, but uh, pip is easy to install. It's a pat pip is a Python package manager. You just install, just say pip install. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Riptide FFA. So you have to be on internet because if you're if you have the internet connection, it'll go out and get all the libraries it needs. So it's straightforward then. N nothing fancy like Prest or uh, Seekproach. No, just just Python. It has okay. C libraries in it, but they're compiled libraries, no run. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and Dan, uh, Mario had a question yesterday about how to install Murmur on a Linux machine. It looks like you solved that problem. Well, his question was how to install um, the new the new one where he did all the, the, the graphs and plots. Um, and I, I, I haven't tried that one. That might not work under Linux because of all the, the, the plotting and graphing. Uh, Murmur is a simpler package. It runs under Wine. So I just use the Wine emulator to run uh, Murmur under Linux. I don't know if the other package would run. No, no, actually, no. No, don't. I mean, actually, just for Windows, no, not Linux. Great. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, and uh, it looks like uh, all the people that you referenced are actually online today. So uh, it's really nice to have everybody. It uh, shows that the collaboration has resulted in uh, the product you've been putting out over at uh, DSS. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Excellent work. Thanks.